So <clears throat> we continue now with the lower limb. And uh, uh, I want to continue with the arches of the foot. Yes, you have previously heard about these arches, uh, which are formed by the tarsal and metatarsal bones. And as you can see in this picture, we only have three um, bony points which um, contact the ground surface. These are the calcanea tuberosity, the first, uh, so the heads of the first and the fifth uh, metatarsal bones, and uh, all the other bones are uh, arranged along these arches. We have longitudinal and transverse arches, which also determine the footprint. And these are very important because these uh, arches create a space for the soft tissues or for muscles, nerves, arteries, veins, and also they allow the foot to support the weight of the body in the erect posture. So as you can see, the body weight acts uh, through the tibia on the calcanea tuberosity, and this is transferred uh, to the anterior part of the foot by these arches. And clinically, these are also important. So this is a small recapitulation. You know that we have uh, longitudinal arches on the medial side. The arch is much higher than on the lateral side. You can see in the schematic drawings that medially the talus is the highest point and laterally the cuboid is the highest point of the uh, longitudinal arches. And uh, in case of the transverse arches, uh, the arch is uh, the highest at the level of the cuneiform bones, as you can see here or in this picture, uh, the media, intermediate cuneiform bone, bone is the highest point of it, but we also have uh, arches more distally, but uh, at the level, for example, of the uh, metatarsal heads, but there the arch is uh, much lower. And these arches must, must be supported and we can distinguish um, passive and active components for this support. The passive uh, components are the ligaments, and here I have listed the most important ligaments which um, keep these arches. And these ligaments um, can cannot get tired, so they have a greater resistance to stress, and they mainly act in standing position. And as you can see in this picture, uh, superficially, most superficially, we have the plantar aponeurosis, uh, as an important component or the long plantar ligament. And the third one is uh, particularly important, the plantar carcaneonavicular ligament, which spans the uh, space between the uh, carcaneus and the uh, navicular bone. And dorsally, we have also important ligaments. Uh, the most important one is the bifurcate ligament, which comes from the carcaneus and radiates toward the uh, navicular and the cuboid. And they can also cause problems. For example, the um, aponeurosis uh, can be stressed. Uh, that is called plantar fasciitis. It's quite a common um, condition and it's very painful, particularly after standing up um, as well in the morning uh, during the first steps. Uh, but we also have dynamic, uh, so-called dynamic arch support formed by muscles. And uh, these muscles um, can get uh, tired, um, but uh, we, we can train these uh, muscles and uh, their tension can be regulated. So um, we have, uh, as you can see in this picture, muscles of the foot, of the sole of the foot. These are the so-called intrinsic muscles. And actually, all the muscles have a function to support these arches, but particularly the flexor uh, digitorum brevis here, or flex, flexor hallucis brevis, 
abductor policies, the lumbricalis interosseus muscles are the most important ones, uh, which um, span the longitudinal arch. But also the so-called extrinsic muscles can uh, support these arches. That means muscles which are located on the leg, but the tendons of which uh, go to the sole. And here I want to emphasize the flexor hallucis longus, the tendon of which you can see here in this picture, uh, or ten, uh, the tendon of uh, flexor digitorum longus uh, is also important. These two muscles uh, support the longitudinal arch, and um, the um, Transverse arch is supported mainly by the tendon of fibularis longus muscle. Yes, this is here visible in this picture. This tendon runs obliquely uh, from the lateral to the medial side uh, as far as the first metatarsal and um, uh, gives the support for the transverse arch like this. And as you can see what happens if uh, the muscle weakens, then uh, we have this spread food because then uh, this arch cannot be kept anymore and all the metatarsal uh, hairs will um, contact the ground surface. And these muscles form uh, also um, loops around uh, particular bones. For example, you can see here, around the fifth metatarsal, we have the fibularis brevis and the fibularis tertius muscles. Both of them insert on the fifth metatarsus, one of them on the planta, the other one on the dorsal surface, and they um, surround the bone like a clamp and they can elevate uh, the fifth metatarsal like this. Or on the medial side, the tibialis anterior and the tibialis posterior form a sling around the medial cuneiform bone. Or the fibularis longus muscle, uh, the tendon of which is not so well visible here, and the tibialis anterior uh, can loop the first metatarsal. So these muscle pairs ca can also contribute to uh, this uh, arch support. And as you can see, um, normally uh, the weight of the body acts, as I mentioned, on the carcaneus, 90% of the body weight acts here, and only 10% is uh, transferred to the anterior part of the foot, so that's the normal condition. You can see here the transverse arch again, uh, with the first and fifth metatarsal heads on the ground, but the other ones are uh, do not contact the um, um, ground surface, but if you walk in shoes like this with high heels, then uh, it can be dangerous because as you can see, most of the body weight will be transported to the forefoot and as a consequence, the um, transverse arch can disappear, as you can see here, that is the spread foot and, um, and it can have then lots of consequences. Yes, you can see the um, uh, forefoot uh, is very wide and uh, it has lots of um, uh, complications, for example, excessive cornifications or uh, hilux valgus can be also, also a consequence of it, as you can see here, due to this uh, wide forefoot, the um, tendon of the extensor hallucis longus will pull the distal phalanx uh, on the lateral side of the uh, metatarsal bone, so it can cause this mal foot malformation and lots of other consequences. Yes, yeah, so these are not relevant for the exam, this clinical um, uh, examples, but I just only want to show why is it important to know the anatomy of the foot. Or, uh, the other uh, quite common uh, condition is the so-called flat foot, but uh, in this case, not the transverse arch, but the longitudinal arch uh, is flattened uh, due to an inadequate arch support. Uh, either the intrinsic muscles of the foot fail or the plantar calcaneo navicular ligament is overextended. That's uh, in most of the cases happens uh, it. And 
if you compare these two pictures here, uh, you can see that um, if this arch disappears, uh, what happens with the talus? Yes, can you see the talus is normally in the air, uh, but um, if the arch disappears, then you can see here the talus will contact the floor. In children, we don't have a uh, longitudinal arch because lots of fat tissue uh, is found on the soul. And yes, we can train our small muscles. You can, for example, after your anatomy exam, you can take your anatomy book and try. You can try to um, tear it with your uh, toes. And lots of other malformations we have, but the details about it you will learn in the orthopedics later. And now we continue with vessels. Yes, um, vessels of the lower limb, starting with the superficial veins. Uh, <clears throat> here, I just want to change my pointer. Uh, here you can see uh, the most important uh, superficial veins of the lower limb and the trunk. And I want to emphasize that these veins are always um, epifascia, that means uh, superficial to the fascia, and so between the skin and the fascia. And we have two important veins, the uh, greater and the lesser saphenous veins. You already know these veins, <clears throat> so both of them um, start in the dorsal venous plexus of the foot on the dorsal surface of the foot and the lesser one ascends behind the lateral malleolus posteriorly and pierces here the fascia in the popliteal region and, and enters the popliteal vein. The greater saphenous vein ascends medially uh, as far as the inguinal, subinguinal region and then uh, it will drain into the femoral vein. So they, the superficial veins must always pierce the fascia to reach a deeper vein. Uh, on this, in this picture on the right side, you can see the uh, superficial veins of the trunk. We, can, we cannot usually um, dissect them, but uh, they are clinically important around the umbilicus. For example, the paraumbilical veins and from here, the blood uh, is transported uh, either upward or downward. So either through the thoracoepigastric vein, upward uh, to the lateral thoracic and axillary vein, or under the umbilicus uh, through the superficial epigastric vein, uh, the blood will be transported to the greater saphenous vein. And why is it important? Because these paraumbilical veins have a contact to the portal vein. You will learn about it next semester, so now it is not relevant, but just to show the importance of these veins, I want to show this condition called caput meduse. Yes, if these uh, paraumbilical veins are dilated, and it happens in alcoholics because <clears throat> the uh, in this case, we have the cirrhotic liver disease, uh, and in and the, the blood cannot pass the liver uh, if the uh, if it if the liver is cirrhotic, and <clears throat> we have the so-called portal vein congestion. So the vein the blood um, tries to escape into another direction, for example, to the direction of the paraumbilical veins, and that's why you can see these dilated veins <clears throat> in this case. That's uh, important for the diagnosis of this uh, cirrhotic liver disease. <clears throat> These pictures show uh, the small saphenous vein. Uh, and here I want to uh, highlight again that these veins are visible through the skin because they are located between the skin and the fascia. And uh, <clears throat> yes, so you, but you know it, you have already heard about the superficial veins <clears throat> earlier. And as I mentioned, they uh, must. To, they must pierce the fascia somewhere. So the supervisual veins 
communicate with a deeper vein, and these uh, communicating veins are called perforant veins, which pierce the fascia. Yes, so the blood is always uh, forwarded toward a deep vein. And because the veins must um, <coughs> work against the gravity, they, are, they contain valves. You can see how they look like. And in this small animation, you can see the function of these valves. They can prevent the, that the blood flows back. And um, they have, that's why, a very important uh, function in the venous return. They can be also made visible with uh, phlebography, as you can see here. <clears throat> or other um, helps, for example, muscle pump uh, helps a lot uh, also in the venous return. That's why it would be very important that uh, after sitting for a long time, you, you always have to stand up and, and move a little bit your, your feet uh, to uh, prevent the venous congestion. And uh, another thing I want to point out, and uh, that's that uh, an artery uh, is always accompanied by, by two veins. Yes, you have heard about in the topographical anatomy. Uh, veins are mostly paired and are uh, surrounded around an artery. And uh, that is um, because the pulsation of the artery can also help the venous return. Or the fascia, yes, you heard uh, about the fascia here in the lower limb. The fascia are particularly important, the crural fascia, fascia or fascia lata, and uh, they belong also to these supporting uh, structures like compression stockings as well. And what happens if um, the venous return is uh, inhibited? Uh, then we have the so-called varices. That means that the superficial veins are enlarged. And as you can see, in most of cases, we have insufficient valves, and then the blood can flow back. And they can look like this. And um, yes, it is also a condition which, which must be cured. Uh, this is not relevant, again, for the exam, but I just show some examples for the treatment. So ultrasound guided sclerotherapy, for example, or laser treatment or removal of these veins um, <clears throat> can be done and carry out. Because uh, we can also have complications. Just some examples. Oedema means swelling of the limb if uh, we have this uh, congestion and if the fluid um, can exit the bloodstream and cannot be transported back again. And uh, as a consequence, the perfusion will be also insufficient. So dermatitis or ulcers can also be consequences. That's why of of the varices or thrombophlebitis, that is if we have a blood clotting within the superficial veins. Uh, and uh, the most dangerous condition is the so-called thrombosis. Uh, it affects uh, the deep veins, yes. And as you can see here, we have blood clots in uh, these deep veins, and these can be released and moved by the circulation forward toward the lung and then uh, the uh, arteries can be uh, closed by these um, uh, blood clots. That's why is it very dangerous. It can be lethal. But let's go further to the arteries. Uh, as you can see in these pictures, the artery for the lower limb is the femoral artery. You already know it is artery which exits the pelvis through the lacuna vasorum of the subinguinal hiatus. And um, in the tie, it has practically only one important branch called profunda femoris artery. And as you can see here, um, this artery gives 
branches for each muscle groups. Yes, last time we discussed the muscle groups and uh, media circumflex, femoral artery uh, supplies the adductors, then the lateral one, the extensors, and we also have perforating branches which pierce the adductor magnus muscle. Here you can see it schematically and um, we will supply the flexor group. So that means that the entire tie is supplied by the profunda femoris artery. And the femoral artery itself only um, goes through the region, enters the adductor canal here, and will um, get into the popliteal fossa through the tendinous hiatus. And in the popliteal fossa, it has its main two branches, anterior and posterior tibial arteries. And that's the rule again, that each muscle group of the leg has its own artery. So the anterior tibialis anter artery supplies the extensor group uh, in the front, the posterior tibial, the flexor group, and it gives us a branch for the fibularis muscles called fibularis artery. The continuation of the anterior tibial artery is the dorsalis pedis artery for the dorsal surface of the foot. Here we also have um, an arch. Uh, oh, sorry, and for the sole of the foot, we have the continuation of the posterior tibial artery. Yes, it will go behind the medial malleolus and form the medial and plantar and lateral plantar arteries. Uh, and these arteries are uh, also, pass point. So most, uh, lots of these arteries can be also used for uh, pulse um, points. Mainly, the dorsalis pedis artery is used for this. Uh, you can see that um, it is uh, it can be palpable laterally to the tendon of the extensor hallucis longus muscle, or posterior tibial artery behind the medial malleolus, or in the popliteal fossa, we can uh, find the popliteal artery, or also here in the subinguinal region, the femoral artery is used for this. But I want to highlight that uh, the aim of this um, is not to uh, determine the heart rate. It is for this uh, mainly the radial artery or the carotid artery is used, but, but um, we can check whether the patient has a good um, circulation, peripheral circulation or not, because if you cannot feel the pulse, it can be a sign for an atherosclerosis, so for a peripheral circulatory disorder. Yes, which is mostly caused by a sclerotic plaque found in the intima of the vessel and of the arteries and uh, the lumen can be uh, narrowed by this plaque. But um, the, in details, you will learn about it uh, in the clinical uh, praxis. You can hear some see here some examples for the consequence of, of this uh, circulatory disorder. In lots of cases, we have uh, ulcerations or, uh, or maybe, maybe also necrosis of uh, the different parts of the food. And here you can see some therapeutic interventions. It's also not relevant for the exam, but it's interesting here, for example, you can see uh, how the lumen of an artery can be enlarged. Yes, uh, if you follow this animation at first, an inflatable ballon catheter is inserted, and then with the help of this, we can compress the sclerotic plaque and as you can see here, the lumen can be enlarged. Or we can insert stands, uh, but in details you will learn uh, later about it. Or maybe one more thing we can use, for example, the uh, greater saphenous vein uh, for grafts. Uh, if it means that the artery, uh, if, uh, if uh, we, uh, it means that with the aid of this vein, uh, we can uh, bypass uh, a narrow uh, part of an artery. Uh, in this uh, angiography, 
uh, you can see again that uh, the femoral artery uh, actually only gives off this uh, profunda femoris branch. Uh, and the femoral artery itself only uh, passes the thigh. But um, it is important where to find the femoral artery, yes, because uh, in case of a bleeding, uh, strong bleeding, you can compress the artery uh, against the hip bone. Uh, we can also uh, carry out uh, Catheter, um, uh, so catheter, catheterizations, it means that we insert a catheter either into the femoral vein or into the femoral artery to reach the heart. Yes, if you insert the catheter into the vein, into the femoral vein, you will reach the right side of the heart and it can be used for therapy of um, cardiac arrhyth arrhythmia, for example. Or if you insert the catheter into the artery, into the femoral artery, you can reach the coronary vessels, uh, which um, originate from the first uh, part of the aorta and you can examine them with a contrast agent or you can uh, carry out uh, insertion of stents or this uh, ballon catheter interventions can be done or also the cerebral arteries uh, can be investigated by this method. Some words about, about the lymph nodes, lymphatic uh, drainage of the lower limb. In details, uh, you have heard about it already in a previous lecture and we also have a handout for this topic but uh, just uh, in some words we can distinguish in the inguinal region superficial and deep lymph nodes the superficial ones are located uh, superficial to the fascia, so epifascial, and they drain the lymph uh, from the lower part of the abdominal wall, from the external genital organs, from the anus, and from a small part of the uterus. Uh, the deep group, which is uh, mainly located parallelly to the longitudinal axis of the femur, uh, drains the lymph uh, from the lower limb. So that means if you have enlarged lymph nodes in this region, like you can, uh, as you can see in this picture, you have to consider uh, carcinoma of these uh, regions. And lymphedema is a condition if the lymphatic drainage is not uh, efficient, uh, main, for example, after removal of the inguinal lymph nodes, it can happen. And as you can see, then that the lymphatic fluid cannot be transported anymore uh, back. Uh, and um, in extreme uh, case, we can have this so-called elephantiasis you can see in the picture if the lower limb is um, particularly enlarged. Okay, but let's go further and I want to uh, speak some words about the nerves of the lower limb. Uh, first of all, you have to know that the lower limb is innervated by two uh, plexus, by the lumbar and the sacral plexus. The you all have to know what uh, we understand under a plexus. It is always formed by the ventral rami of spinal nerves in case of the lumbar plexus uh, from the segments of DH12 uh, to L4. And in this semester, we, we won't see all uh, the branches of this plexus, but I underlined uh, those branches you can recognize in a picture. And these are the femoral nerve, the obturator nerve, and the lateral cutaneous femoral nerve. And as you can see, these nerves uh, are mixed. And in general, we can see, we can say it uh, about the uh, spinal nerves that they are mixed. They also, they both have um, muscular and uh, muscular branches and skin branches. And as you can see, uh, the femoral nerve innervates, for example, the extensor group of the thigh, or the obturator, obturator nerve innervates the adductor group. But 
all these branches have also sensory uh, branches. And the skin nerves are always located epifascia again, so between the skin and the fascia. So there, there we have the uh, skin veins, the superficial veins. The further three branches, um, you do not have to recognize, but in the theory, you have to know that these nerves uh, innervate the abdominal muscles and they also have a skin innervation. So in this picture on the right side, I show where which branch, uh, so which uh, skin areas are innervated by the different uh, branches of the lumbar plexus. So practically we can see, say that the anterior and medial side of the thigh and the medial stripe of the leg uh, and parts of the, uh, so practically these areas are innervated by the branches of the lumbar plexus and the rest uh, will be innervated by the sacral plexus. And the next picture shows the most important branches of the sacral plexus. Yes, so it is formed under the lumbar one, so uh, from the ventral rami of the uh, spinal nerves uh, from L4 to S3. The most important uh, branches are first of all the sciatic nerve. Yes, so the sciatic nerve is the thickest nerve of the body and it will innervate the flexor group. So it also has have uh, naturally uh, motor branches. The two most important branch of the sciatic nerve is the tibial nerve. Yes, the tibial nerve will be the nerve, the motor nerve for the flexor group of the leg. So the nerve will be found uh, on the posterior side of the leg, so in the posterior crural region. Uh, then the other branch of the sciatic nerve is the common peroneal, which will be then divided into a superficial peroneal and a deep peroneal nerve. And as you can see, the superficial nerve will innervate the fibularis group, the deep will innervate the extensor group of the leg. And all of these nerves have also sensory branches. Yes, as you can see, the uh, uh, medial and lateral uh, cutaneous um, sura nerves will form uh, then the sura nerve on the leg. And if you follow the tibial nerve, it will go behind the medial myeleolus and will divide into a medial and lateral plantar nerves, which will be the motor nerve uh, nerves for the plantar muscles together with skin branches. Um, and as you can see in this picture on the right side, the different uh, skin areas are innervated by these nerves uh, I listed on the left side. And further branches of the sacral plexus are found in the gluteal region. Yes, so superficial, uh, sorry, superior and inferior gluteal nerves posterior cutaneous femoral nerve and pudendal nerve. And the pudendal nerve, we do not have to know in details in this semester because it innervates the perineal muscles, uh, which uh, we will learn only next semester. Um, the nerves can be damaged um, either um, close to the spinal uh, cord or more distally. But uh, more, one of the most common conditions uh, and nerve damages uh, are, is caused by the pul pulposus herniation. About you, you have previously heard about it. Uh, if you remember, in this case, the annulus fibrosus um, is um, torn and the nucleus pul pulposus is um, protruded and it um, compresses, it can compress the spinal radices or the, the spinal nerves. And in this case, the symptoms will 
appear according to the segments, uh, according to the um, yeah, the in to different uh, skin areas, as you can see in the on the left side. So, for example, radiating pain can occur, and if you follow these segments, for example, if the lesion is at the level of L5, you can see that the symptoms will occur on the lateral side of the thigh, and then if you follow it further. Uh, to the toward the big toe. So it is not relevant again for the exam, but uh, later if you will carry out a neurological examination, uh, you will use this uh, knowledge uh, for the diagnosis. Or if a nerve is um, damaged more distally, so if the peripheral nerve um, is damaged, the symptoms will uh, show the innervation of the, uh, the nerve itself. So for example, you can see here the injury of the common peroneal nerve. The nerve runs behind the head of the fibula, so quite superficially we can find this nerve and that's why um, it is uh, the most often injured uh, nerve of the lower limb, uh, for example, in case of a fibula fracture, or it can have uh, a reversible uh, functional loss if you are sitting for a long time in this position with crossed legs or in car. Uh, and in this case, so if the nerve um, is damaged, we have the so-called foot drop uh, sign. That means the dorsal flexion of the foot cannot be done because the, the nerve innervates the extensor muscles uh, together with the fibularis muscles, but um, the extension movement will fail and the patients have, have a typical gait called stepage gait. If you look at these videos, you can see how it looks like. In the clinical praxis, nerve blocks are uh, very commonly used for, uh, for example, anest uh, uh, for anesthetization or to relieve pain. And again, you do not have to know the details of, of this, but uh, uh, I just want to highlight why is it important to know where the nerves are found. For example, if you take, if you have a look at this picture, where uh, the sciatic nerve is shown, you can see how to find the sciatic nerve uh, for this nerve block or in the popliteal uh, fossa, you can find the tibial or the uh, common peroneal nerves. Or close to the foot, you can find more uh, nerves or sural nerve or superficial peroneal nerve can be also uh, anesthetized. And uh, muscles have also a sensory innervation. Yes, we usually speak only about the motor innervation of a, of a muscle, but um, in neuroanatomy, you will learn in details about the sensory innervation. So that means that the muscle tone uh, or if, if the muscle gets stretched, we have uh, sensory fibers to detect these uh, informations, and uh, this information will also um, uh, reach the brain. And it is used, for example, uh, so the sensory innervation is used uh, in this reflex examinations. You can see here the most uh, uh, common reflex examination, the patella reflex. In this case, the uh, quadriceps femoris muscle uh, will be stretched through this uh, reflex hammer, and this stimulus will then uh, cause the contraction of the muscle. And this examination is used for the diagnosis of um, 
of uh, this, of, for example, of loss uh, of um, uh, segmental innervation. So you can uh, use it to determine the segment uh, of the uh, functional loss, for example, in case of the Achilles reflex. Uh, so the Achilles reflex can be also used for this. So we have lots of uh, uh, reflex examinations, but in details, you will learn about it in neuroanatomy. Or we have, can have also uh, plantar reflex examinations. Okay, so um, that's all what I wanted to say today, and um, thank you for your attention.